Welcome to Have Movies Will Game, the only podcast on the globe where we take you, our friendly listener, through the best and worst movies of yesterday and today, and then discuss ways that you can play them at your gaming table. In every episode, our intrepid hosts, Matthew, Dusty, and Nathaniel, will filibuster fondly over facts and feelings of your favorite films, and then get to the glorious gaming goodness, giving Game Masters great gimmicks on generating golden genius. Have Movies Will Game, brought to you through the electronic wonder of the internet. Now, let's start the show! It is good to see you guys. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's been a while. I could take it or leave it. Oh, <laughs> I'm really bitch. excited about tonight. This is <laughs> you've been wanting to do this, this movie this for a is, while. This is one of my favorite movies in the history of everything. We're doing uh, we're doing Master and Commander, and uh, we're joined by Scott this week. Uh, and you who, may remember and who are him. You? Hey, hold on, I'm I'm finishing my Scott spiel. <laughs> uh, you may remember Scott from uh, the Three Musketeers episode. Turns out Scott is a, a fan of historical fiction and. Uh, the associated cinema and role-playing games that go with it. So uh, we're glad you came back aboard for this one. My pleasure. Huzzah! And uh, I, yes, am Matthew. And I'm Dusty. And I'm Nathaniel. And we are doing Master and, and Commander. And I'm Scott, <laughs> sitting in as a fan of historical fiction. Yeah, so this this week yet, as as you said, we're doing Master and Commander, the far side of the world. I didn't say that. Stop taking me out of context. Or as I like to call it, the best Star Trek episode you've never seen. What? Yeah, that's what I was thinking the whole time. This is the first time I've seen this movie. Explain. And the whole thing Fast. was like, this is like a, f- this is full on like a TNG episode, only just like on water. There's no poetry. Nobody cares about data. <laughs> There's not <laughs> poetry, but there is, there's, there's everything about this. Is like, music. It, it is, I could basically see this as a TNG episode in space. How? Just the whole thing. That's everything. not a how. That's just <laughs> holding it up and saying "cuz." Well, first how? off, first off, I agree with you. Thank Dusty. you. Thank I, you. I can totally see where you're coming from, mm-hmm. and it's not an insult. No, it is. No, it's really not. No, this is about war. They're not here to make <laughs> peace with people. TNG was a warship. Yeah, it was not. It was, was an exploratory ship. It was a galaxy yeah. class. Yeah, destroyer, basically. Essentially, and yet yeah. that goes against the entire tenants. It goes they against the tenants, to- but they fucking had lasers and photon torpedoes i don't i don't like the motives you're impugning picard with i i I think i think you should take a step back before before the hordes of starfleet come down upon you in a in a passive aggressive horde this was released in 2003 uh and it was a good movie this is the first time i i've watched it uh i enjoyed it i really did like it there there seemed to be now now i know this this is there it spans 15 novels 21. 20, 21 novels. Okay. Well, not the movie. Just oh, no, I know. So I know. Like, they did pick and pull Yeah, from I think them. they took from the first book and like the 10th book. No, they it, took it, from it, about seven just books. Check I in. just finished the series. Okay. Those novels are? Oh, that's the uh, Aubrey Martin series by uh, Patrick O. How do you pronounce Is it Maturin? 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 I don't know. I've oh, never oh. heard it said. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick uh, O'Brien. Yeah, Patrick O'Brien. Okay. Master and Commander is the name of the first book. At the far side of the world, uh, there was, there was never, there was never an Acheron in any of the books. I mean, it's just, they just basically history on that one. Okay. Well, which you probably know about it though. Maybe, but there, there's just something in this movie that speaks to me. I've, I've always loved the sea. Uh, I've always loved, uh, this era. Mm -hmm. I actually have my longest ever to date on this show running notes. Oh, nice. Watching this movie. Mm -hmm. And they're all. Yeah, you were texting me the other night. I was texting you last (laughs) night as I was watching this. Yeah. He's like, the kid's arm. No. No. Yeah. I, I like the movie. I was not, that was not an insult of it being like the. It was a little. I mean, no, it wasn't. No, no, no. It wasn't. The next generation. (laughs) Fuck off with that shit. (laughs) So I, I do know that the, the, the film in the film version the action takes place in 1805 during the napoleonic wars uh-huh. uh instead of 1813 during the anglo-american war of 1812 so i did a little bit of research on the on the backs of, the but, books goes right through it it does all, all the it, way up to uh napoleon i i know i shouldn't reference the books but i'm gonna no no that's so, I, just so you with know. that with this many books in that, that have been turned into one movie there's no way we're not going to be able to reference the book, so I completely understand. But I do know that the producers wanted to avoid offending American audiences, so that the um, the the opponent was changed from the USS Norfolk, yeah. to the yeah. uh, Acheron, yeah. Because I mean, let's face it, fuck the French, right? I mean, that's <laughs> universal. Go. D- depending upon 
where you're from, mm-hmm. the U.S. or the U.K. or Europe or whatever, the War of 1812 was part or not part of the Napoleonic campaigns. So the U.S. typically says, no, 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 it was just a war between us and England. Mm-hmm. And England's like, no, 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 it was part of our full-on war with France because we were blockading you from doing trade with them. Oh. And then there was the whole Sp- Spanish thing like two years earlier. Yeah, so depends on who you ask. Okay, England is like our biggest fucking ally in the oh, world. At this point, yeah. yeah How now, did that happen? Wait, we flipped we do them this, off. We do this thing in we America. We rebelled against them. We murdered their people, and now we're all cool. So you're a fan of Japan, right? Yeah. I don't know Can how that happened either. Can you see any similarities? <laughs> not, it, it's, no. it's kind of what we do. I'm just it's like, like oh, we tear them down and we guns, build them back up. Guns. Yeah, have, we tried to murder you, but we cool. We ha, cool now. Yeah. Have you ever watched um, Eddie Izzard's Dress to Kill? Or, oh, it's amazing. Yeah, the yeah. whole part about where where we came in and we we're fighting, you know, World War II with the Brit. Go rewatch that whole sequence. That explains a lot of it. I've seen that <laughs> a dozen times. I love it. I have to. I'll have to rewatch that sequence. Yeah, I love the the contrast that he presents between Americans and Britons, and the whole. It's the like of death. <laughs> you you are my wife, and you fucked her. Right. If you haven't seen it, Eddie Izzard <laughs> dress to kill. It's amazing. It, it's classic. It's infinitely quotable. I think Russell Crowe was born to play this role. He's a little beefy, who, which Aubrey is. He was not a lean man. No, I didn't think he so. was supposed to, supposedly florid, and you know loved huge meals and uh, <laughs> and like to uh, drink. Kind of a rake around the women folk. And I, th- I honestly think this was the best role I've ever seen Russell Crowe in. Yeah, that that's one of my mm. notes here. Crow is goddamn amazing in yeah. this role. He, he, he was, was really great good. in this movie. I liked him more in Gladiator, personally. Eh. Anyone could have done mouth. that. Anyone could have done that, though. There's a lot of people who could have played that. Um, th- this was something I think only he could pull off. I can agree with that. Yeah. I, I, I Again, I liked this movie a lot. Uh, Too many lean, muscular guys. You need a kind of chunky but still powerful man. To, I Just physically. To pull this off. Yeah. In modern day, if this were redone, do you think Vinny Jones could do it? I don't know who that is, so I have no answer. (laughs) I don't think so. (laughs) Vinny Jones, have you seen Snatch? Yes. He was bullet tooth Tony. Oh, Jesus. Uh, (laughs) No, too too fucking weird. (laughs) There's no no subtlety in Vinny Jones. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. I'll go with that. Yeah. You probably don't know this if you've just watched the movie, but his friend, the doctor was actually a spy and an intelligence agent. Yeah. I kind of gathered through because the, they set up in the beginning of the movie they were talking about a that there was a spy. Color. Yeah. And it kind of gravitated towards Paul Bettany's character as I thought was just ended up being the spy. And Paul Bettany being the doctor. Okay. His 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 buddy. For those of you not yeah. listening. Um or, sorry, for yeah. those of you who have not seen and, it. And I yeah. thought he was going to be a French spy in the long run, but then reading a little bit more on the history of the book, yeah. He was a spy for the 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 Brits, and there's apparently a whole book that he goes into hates him being Napoleon. There's oh, a whole yeah. book about the the captain going and rescuing him, apparently mm-hmm. before he gives a couple up of secrets. times. Okay, cool. And if you've made it this far, by the way, spoilers. <laughs> as, Sorry, yeah, as, always, as, as always, you stop, should know this by now. Yeah, stop, watch the movie, come back. Yeah, we'll be so here. Apparently, this movie was supposed to set up an entire franchise because of the book. I really wish it did. Really and wish it did. despite the critical acclaim. And getting a pair of Oscar wins, and I mean, getting a nomination for Best, Best Picture that year, and large success overseas, the film was considered like a failure over here in the states. And monetarily, it was because the budget was like 150 million. It took in like 93 it's those million. Those water sets, man. Those water sets. But overseas, it took in like 250 million. So yeah. it did well overseas. And I really wish that it had set up a franchise. I am sick of nautical fiction movies and television that are just pirate stuff. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm tired of pirates. I, I like the organized, regimented, yeah. this is the British fucking Navy. Like, Flog that, that man! That <laughs> entire first 10 minutes of the movie showed yeah. just military the discipline, discipline yeah. and precision. And well, I am simply, I'm tired of Jack Sparrow. Agreed. Oh, yeah. I am tired of black sails. I'm tired of that whole flippant pirate lifestyle being the only nautical fiction that we ever get like even in the pirates of the caribbean movies just seeing at Com- commodore north or whatever yeah, north, all my sympathy north, was, like, was with him i'm with i'm with you dude yeah i get it you're a dick but fucking at least hang him you have some order <laughs> yeah hang that hang that asshole fuck johnny depp i um 
it, it's a really interesting uh, time for human knowledge too. What is it? What what a fascinating modern era we live in is one of the quotes That's from one of the my movie. Favorite quotes yeah. from the whole movie. Um, where we're just we're just coming out of where we're starting to understand systems and systemology. Mm-hmm. Where if we pay enough attention to maths, we can circumnavigate the globe. If we pay enough attention, we can throw an iron ball a mile. If we pay enough attention, and it, it's just it's the start of where all our modern science is based mm-hmm. and our, our modern scientific methodology is, is based out of, out of this era. And I love seeing that, that, that exactitude that with wood and metal, no electricity, the, the only thing that is, is faintly modern that we still use is a goddamn sextant and a magnet in the compass. And that's it. And you can put yourself right where you want to be if you're disciplined and you pay attention. And to accent that statement, like even when something was damaged and fucked up, they saw value in it because it was all that they had at sea. They were limited to only the resources of things that they could do. They were shaving the damn figurehead Mm -hmm. just to get scraps. Yeah. And when he, when they're talking about how old the ship is and he turns and he looks lovingly at oh, the I entire love that whole scene. ripped mm-hmm. open mm-hmm. hallway, that doorway. She's in her prime. And he just yeah. taps it. He's in her prime. <laughs> and he says it without a sense of irony. Like, yes. Well, one of the things, uh, to nod to the books real fast, is um, Master and Commander, the book that most of this was taken off of, the first book, wasn't they, they weren't in the surprise. That comes later. Uh, the doctor actually bought it. Hmm. Uh, for him when he was uh, kicked off the list during the piece. They were in the Sophie for the oh, that's majority right. of uh, where this book takes place, or where this movie mm-hmm. takes place. I love the surprise. I wish it was a real boat. I want it so bad. <laughs> when this, the movie started, I initially thought this was just going to be a standard chase movie, just like a, like a Hollywood chase movie, just on, on sea. Uh, it was, you know, like set on the sea, but... Uh, the more I thought about after watching the movie, the just it became more like I thought about it, and and yeah, the heroes are chasing an evil French privateer for reasons we really oh not evil, they they have not great evil. admiration for each other. He even says he just well, he's, he's quote, looking he's off evil. into the mist. Damn fine gutter. Yeah, yeah. Like, or that uh, level of respect. what what did I do to this man? Kill a child of his? God forbid. I mean, he's they're there. They're doing their duty. This whole this whole movie is about duty and discipline. Yes. Duty. <laughs> would you say duty and honor? Oh, well, yes, I would. Foreshadowing. <laughs> but I, also the movie is to, was more about to me between nicely a relationship. Done. What? I said nicely done, Nathaniel. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> to me, the movie was more about a relationship between two old friends. Oh, very uh, much so. Portrayed brilliantly in those, you know, in those quiet moments, especially in, in those when they're playing the cello and, and the and the violin. And for a movie that was produced on such a large scale, it seemed more concerned with the small moments between those two people than anything else. That's what makes any war movie good, though. It's the small humanizing moments that you find against a weird tapestry of war. Yeah. And the other thing that real quick, the other thing that I really liked about it is it wasn't set up so much as an overall action movie. It was it was a movie about uh, a commander and his men and how those men are treated and what goes on in a daily life. And I really like that aspect and not just like boom, c- explosions at sea and fire and shrapnel and, and cannons bursting. I, I giant I, wicked hamster wheels and where's the rub <laughs> gone and fuck Johnny Depp and fuck Disney. Not just two old friends, but two new friends and those friends being Aubrey and the captain of the other ship. There is that the cat and mouse. There's a Tom and Jerry aspect to this oh, yeah. movie. Who's chasing who Which at any great. one time? You have this very visual, hands-on relationship between the captain and the doctor that you can see, you can look, you can touch, you can hear. It's right there in front of you. And then you have this implied, subtle relationship between the captain, Aubrey, mm-hmm. and the captain of the French ship mm-hmm. that is beautiful. It is subtle. I love it. One of the things I like about uh, this particular era are the manners of it. Like he's like when he's mad about not being put down at the Galapagos and Aubrey turns to him in a fury and says, we don't have time for your damn hobby, sir. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was but then there's a pause and they look at each other and Aubrey knows exactly what he said. That yep. was wrong. Yep. He, he knew you he crossed see that line. remorse mm-hmm. and then he just moves on with it. I, he didn't. I, I read that scene completely differently. He's furious because no, he, he is. He's dealing with both. 
He's dealing with the fury. Because after he leaves the room, he looks down at his maps, planning his next move, and he looks back up at the camera. He's like... <sighs> because he's he, angry. He's conflicted. Fuck. He is angry, but he also... Have have you ever felt two emotions at the same time? I'm like a simple someone creature. Someone that you love has pissed you off, but you love them, and you're like, oh, I love you, but you've pissed me off. I have to deal with how I feel about this. Mm-hmm. So he has to I'm deal with... I'm apparently a very simple creature. <laughs> he has to deal with his emotions of having just pissed off his friend and knowing the consequences that that could bear on his future happiness in one of the best friendships he's ever had, yeah. but also with his duty to the military to do this. One of them clearly takes preference over the other. Well, that's one of the, one of the things that I was, I was trying to touch on was that this is an era where you movie. don't ask people about their thoughts. Like the whole modern concept of what you think and why you doing that. Mm-hmm. That's not done. People are very independent. They're their own little worlds. And you don't, you, in that era, you didn't really question why people did the things they did. Each, you just went around, you just went along with it. Yeah. Each, each person was, they, they were left alone and their motivations weren't really discussed. And I really like that. This is a non sexist movie about men dealing with their emotions. <laughs> it really is. There's to a degree, no yeah. women in the movie. No, and that was something else yeah. that I really liked about it. If if you don't if you don't mind me kind of getting in Go on for that. it, the production company didn't include any cutaways of like long suffering sweethearts back home. They didn't introduce some alluring like. Well, they didn't introduce any like any of the quote unquote natives. There was that brief exchange like long glance like, yeah there was that yeah. long glance of like ooh maybe but throw away in pieces yeah the, if, if it were to be if the movie were to be remade now it would be like rife with these cutbacks and additional scenes purely for the younger audience and to pursue you know more of that more everything has to have an action and an explosion right now but with the intentions of a franchise that were well defined and with the beginning popularity of the of the pirate series the studios today would most likely take a push to a, a main character that's Really, a character instead of the you know the brooding between, in some way. What we saw, tormented. On on the note of the sweethearts, though, the the Russell Crowe apparently fought hard not to have a love interest in the movie, and the studio wanted to put Kira Knightley in as oh, thank fucking god, as they a love did interest not. as no. as Sophie uh-uh. back because there's that letter where he's writing, dear Sophie. Yeah. Kira Knightley's too hot. Sophie in the books is is rather plain. I will say that <laughs> I. By this point, if you've been listening, I, you probably know me as someone who is like hardcore about interesting and well-defined female characters in movies. I, I think we all are. I am really, yeah. really glad there were no women in this movie because it definitely, it was a story of men at sea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's totally fine. That's what this movie was. Now, I don't know a lot of, I, I've never really focused on this historical point of view. It's never really, or point time and point in, in, in time it's never really fascinated me as much as it might you or or you scott or even you nathaniel is it a hollywood thing like when they were in the when they're all dining is it a hollywood thing for the officers to remain in uniform and not oh yeah get at relaxed? the captain's table okay. oh yeah okay oh, so yeah. They, that would have they would have stayed <laughs> that was a formal event okay where various members of like the midshipmen the mm-hmm. lieutenant and the ship's officers like um, you would have the the master of the marines there, who is normally the guy there. in the red, yeah, yeah, and then um, you would have alternating the purser, the carpenter, and it's how a captain would take the tone of what's going on in his ship. Yeah, not everyone got to to be there every time. No, I, I understand that. Deal. I just didn't. I was just curious if if they stayed in the tight, like if they wore all of their full uniform. I would think that I would think it'd be a little more relaxed. No, you you're. It's a very, like, they did a very good keeping it of its time mm-hmm. in which that's what you wore. I mean, it wasn't like you don't have, like, relaxed clothes. You have your clothes, mm-hmm. which may not be comfortable, but that's what you're wearing. That's your job, and you're wearing your clothes, and you're always on your job. Well, No, I, I get that, but being so stuffy, for lack of a better word. I mean, they were still buttoned up all the way to the to the throat. They weren't like... So, their jackets weren't undone a little bit and captain the, is very much unquote, God. relaxed so uh, dusty mm-hmm. imagine yourself on a tank crew you're in a tank mm-hmm. it's a it's a vessel designed for war that vehicle serves one purpose and that is fucking up the enemy yeah. okay imagine you're on a tank for a year you can't leave that tank all you brought with you is your uniform and your underwear 
I get that. No, I totally get that. So but now, I mean, like, why, you and your tank why crew... Why would you, like, take off the jacket and, like, set it somewhere? I mean, why would, would you continue to wear, like, your Discipline, heavy... because the Discipline. only thing that okay. keeps this little Discipline world of ours respect. afloat... Okay. Oh, no, no, I'm actually quoting from the movie. That keeps this little floating world of ours running is discipline men must be governed <laughs> okay fair enough all right well done my ignorance is spotlighted thank you so much but that's just the one i'm speaking <laughs> <laughs> that's just the one you get it again yeah <laughs> nicely done nicely done oh, i know when he cut off his arm poor, poor kid oh, oh god poor lord blakely you know what that kid was badass oh, yeah <laughs> that is not uncommon to go as a midshipman it was considered a great favor yeah. like an admiral would have, or a uh, or a uh, politician at the time, would have a young, likely lad, and they would send him into these rough conditions round about at age twelve. That kid just got the fuck up at the end of the movie when they're and, storming yeah. that ship. He's like, "We've got to bolt them!" and he runs in, <laughs> shoots oh my a guy, God, and then great. stabs another I mean, one with like, his one you know arm. What? I've got one arm, and I want to be a scientist, but. But you want to stop the problems with kids? Put them in uniform and give them a sword. <laughs> that kid had bigger cojones than anybody he was commanding. Like that kid. Oh yeah. Oh once yeah. More into the breach. I'm going into that breach. Yeah. I, you know, and, and I love the the interplay between he and the the captain when when he was upset towards the end because he wanted to be on you know and storm the the other ship with everybody else. And the captain's like, I need you here. <laughs> or you're gonna lead that. And he's like, Sweet, okay. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I get to fire the guns. <laughs> Well, he he's literally putting a 12-year-old in control of his ship. Mm -hmm. Like, for that moment, he is, it's all him. Yeah. And not only that, but it's on him if Should anything any, goes wrong. Yeah. So let's actually talk about some of the technical stuff. I have lots of notes about the technical stuff. Anybody want to lead in? Because I will, if you don't. Go, go ahead. I'll, I'll lead, yield the floor to you on this one. All right. Every shot of this movie tells you exactly what you need to know as a landlubber. Every single moment in this film, nothing is wasted, but nothing is drawn out. All of the shots of things at sea, they're not, they don't linger too long. They focus on, oh no, this guy's getting swept over. Okay, now we're moving over here. Now we're moving in here. This thing is cracking. There's a cannon firing. There's something happening. And then there's that pause. There's that pause of, What's coming next? That pause that you as a sailor might experience of that undue silence in the middle of warfare. I really like it at the beginning where that uh, cannonball oh, hits near God. Aubrey and it just it just goes quiet. And he, oh, yeah. And he, looks, in his and he, and he blinks yeah. and it's but like, ah, ah. The and, cannons fire when they escape into the mist mm -hmm. at the beginning of the movie. When their rudder is destroyed and they're just hoping they're desperate. Oh, when they're being like, pulled by being the pulled. by the life by the life rafts. Even even then, they moved with military efficiency, but it moves into the silence and the music kicks out, mm -hmm. and it's just the sound of fog and the sound of water and the sound of the cannon fire splashing nearby them. The tension. Oh, oh God! It's so good. It was yeah. it was good. There are there are movies that. In, inspire a feeling or an, a, a want, a need in people. And this makes me need to go buy a boat. I mean, just badly. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't care. I mean, I need to be on living water again after watching this movie. No, I agree with Nathaniel. There is very little time spent on pretty pictures. Like, oh, this is a really cool shot of the ocean. This is a really cool, like, no, they're telling it's the story that's going on. And there's a lot to be said about pretty pictures in movies. Like we were talking 2001 before, very pretty. Very long, pretty picture. A lot of pretty long, great. So you can have great movies that just look really good, but this one doesn't linger on those really, there's a couple, you know, outside all the ships sailing by. Uh, it just gives you a little taste of like, oh, it's, you know, it's nice. Boom. Okay. But back to like what we're talking about, you get the sense of, Oh, we're, we're out on the ocean when they're on deck. You're like, Oh, we're out on the ocean. Here's the ocean. It's vast. It's, it's, it's infinite. And then like, Oh, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're below decks. It is tiny and cramped and 18 a, inches. Yeah. So like they go, they can go from one to the other, you know, in a snap and you're there all the time. The vastness of the ocean is never more shown to you as an audience until the last Scene? three yeah. seconds of yeah. the movie that that high shot as they go back up they yeah the the two of them play their song mm -hmm. they lead out the movie and then the song finishes 
and there's silence for three seconds. And during that three seconds, it's nothing but the vastness of the ocean. You see the ship sailing. You hear the rocking credits. Yeah. It was intense. So, I had forgotten that. And that was my favorite moment when I first saw the movie. And then last night when I watched it again, again, I had forgotten most of this movie, but that part I was like, holy th- shit. This is really one of my favorite movies of all time. I just, I, I'll, I will be watching it until I die at least a couple times a year. I'll watch it again. And, and one of the comments that were made about the sound, uh, cause I know you like, you're a big thing on Foley and mm-hmm. the sound is amazing. Uh, yeah. The sound is amazing in this movie. And I, and I did a little bit of d- research on it in most movies. Now explosions are made digitally and then they, they amp them up and whatnot. The sound designer, Richard King, uh, he had, mur- had, he had earned an, an Oscar for this because one of the things that, that he did was he went out to someone that was a, a historical consultant that he talked to that had, had owned a 24 pound and a 12 pound cannon. Ugh. And they actually recorded the cannons going off like a microphone right there. And then they did another one 300 yards away. So they got the shrieking as the, as the, the, the balls and the chains went across the sky. Um, and then the, and then a lot of the sounds, the, the shots hitting the ship, they'd set up wooden targets at the artillery range and then blasted them with the cannon. So it could be as authentic as possible instead of it being, because this, this movie came out in 2003, so that digital, it was coming in a little bit more, and Foley was changing a little bit, but they wanted to keep it as much as possible to authentic sounds. And it's amazing on the technical level. How much was digitally done? Not a lot. So most of that was like sets them at sea, yeah, rocking uh, around, being fucked up by the water and storms and shit? Yeah, there was an actual, there were, there was... um uh, the ship, Russell Crowe's ship, there were two models made of that, two full-size models, one that they could actually put to sea, and then one that they could they could blow up. Are we talking, like, Goonies pirate ship size yes. models? Holy yes. shit. And like, the, the fucking with, thing existed. Yeah, and, yeah. Oh, and it was bought by a, by the state. Uh, I forget which state <laughs> bought it. I think, uh, I think from, I think Maine bought it. It's in, Maryland, in the museum. Maine. Um, and then the like Acheron. That. All right, I'm they, taking a road trip. <laughs> yeah, they, they built two Acherons, one that they could actually film film on and then the other one that they could blow up and put holes well in. i know where all that money went <laughs> <laughs> but there were up. but there were also miniature sets made for like the wide shots also so but yeah there were there was little digital special effects it was a lot of it was practical so a lot of people got hurt on set too um and then also russell crowe learned how to play the violin for this movie he that's played. amazing. I was actually watching how he was holding the bow, and I'm like, oh, he knows actually he's holding it correctly. He he took lessons yeah. to learn how to play, which was great. That's that's amazing. Yeah. So did you catch those canon names? Yeah. Yes. Sudden death. Mm-hmm. That was jumping wonderful. jumping jack, I think was one of them or something like that. Love the canon names. One of the first things you see in the whole movie are those canon names. Yeah. I like I like the early exploring the ship in in the dog watch hours where he's just wandering around making sure everyone's in their rack. I mean it's it's a great way to introduce uh as just the basically the guard wandering around. I I I there's nothing I didn't like about this movie. I can usually find a point of disconnect in any movie. I don't have one here. No, no, no. Find one. I think, don't have it. Think on it. I've watched the movie 40 times easily. <laughs> God damn it. I don't have it. Find one. one That's your thing. There, the, one of the things... The, the, the scene I don't like that, how he says phasmid. Phasmid. Okay, that's all I got. One of the scenes <laughs> that I absolutely loved was the the trickery scene where they... Oh, which one? Oh, the one where they put out the, the little... Uh, the raft where the kid goes out yeah. on the raft and then they douse all the lights and then they go completely around the Acheron and come up behind it. That was brilliant. I also like the Jonah that really yeah. highlighted how even as you're moving into a, a modern way of thinking, how the old superstitions lie. And that that's true to this day on the sea. There's no whistling in the wheelhouse because it'll call a storm and you will get the shit beat out of you if you do it. That leads me to one of my notes, which was a question for all three of you here at the table. I lost track of everyone. There were so many people in this movie and mm-hmm. they I, I lost track of who was who. I couldn't remember. The guy who killed himself, was he the same guy who was singing? Yes. Yes. Okay. Second, that 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 solves that answer. 
the what guy a lovely who, voice he has. Yes. The guy who they abandoned at sea, who fell off the mast when the mast. Oh, cracked. that was heartbreaking. Who was he? I don't remember him. He until was. That uh, he was the guy who got Whip's best friend. Mm-hmm. Okay, but that's his thing. I don't remember him before that movie. No, no. So, Did so the guy. Cool? He was also the guy who was. Correct me if I'm wrong. He was also the guy who was stationed where the Acheron was built. And yeah. he yes. made the model. Yes. Oh, okay. Which that right. model was that whole that scene was really good too. And the, the give him some more rum and you know walking out. They do that a few robbed. times. <laughs> yeah. So those are the only ones that I was like, okay, I'm supposed to feel lost for this character. I and then there's widely. Pippin. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Pippin. <laughs> Pippin. Pippin. Yeah. And he had that weird scar under his I liked eye that it. was yeah. well done. Did you notice the big ear, scar on Russell Crowe's ear? For no. his character, it was like his his ear had been like cut and mangled. Yeah. What? Okay. The guy who kept quoting the Bible was he the same guy whose head was operated on? Yes. yes. That makes sense. Hold fast. Because yeah. I remember they're like, oh, he spoke, and I was wondering if that was the same guy. Why the hell did they put a silver coin in his skull? Oh, because they had to remove the piece of skull, and you need something hardened to okay. keep your brains in. Okay. Because they didn't really. It, 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 it didn't really explain what exactly had happened to him. And I thought that they had... They did. Uh, during the battle, a tackle fell on his head, knocked him down. I guess I guess I just didn't notice that. I just thought that they were they were taking out some part of his brain. No, and then they the, were, skull, the okay. skull was depressed. Okay. All right. Interesting. I didn't get that because they didn't show him putting the coin in. I thought he had used the coin. I thought the coin was special mm-hmm. because it had those holes in it. So I was like, oh, he's using it as like a measurement tool. Yeah, it just uh, and then it puts just it over the skull, puts it. some little screws in there, and all sews the, the flap of skin back over it. All of the medical scenes cut away too quickly. I wanted to, I'm not really into medical scenes in mm-hmm. movies. They actually kind of really squick me out. But both the amputation and the the thing on the head. Oh God, the foley during the amputation. Oh my God, that just, that, that soft wanted, sawing, that wanted, soft wet sawing. I wanted to see just a little bit more to make sure, mm-hmm. like to kind of. Eh, I'm torn. The way they did it was fine. Me as a viewer here in 2018, I'm used to a little bit more gore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I, I liked it. The doctor going, you know, when when the when the the boy came to. And then he started to gasp, you know, he put the, he put the bit in and he started to gasp. He said, you know, something like take care, bite hard. And then to, nope. rea- to reassure everybody, <laughs> he didn't do a thing. to reassure everybody, he's like, it's just the lot of them speaking. And yeah. He didn't say anything to the kid. It's like, there's no point in this. I'm about to saw your arm off. So we're just going to strap you down. He's going to hold you. And, and we're doing in your this. Mouth and we're yeah. going. Honestly, if I, at that point in time, if I had to have my arm lopped off, I would rather Not it, just your arm. Your right arm. I, I know, but have them take a heavy axe and lop it off in one chop. Savage. Then saw it, saw through the bone. But That's I'm not. Trauma. Medical, I'm I mean, because he he cut the meat with his with his scalpel. Uh, yeah, and then he used a bone saw, which is what it's for. But the the doctor operating on himself later on that was great. Oh mm-hmm. god, oh, I loved it. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> hold the mirror. I know. I something he's. I need to see. Hold the mirror. Yeah, that was that was great. That reminded me of. Prometheus, which was a conflicted movie that had its ups and its downs. That's a really nice way of saying that. <laughs> but the self <laughs> that's a polite way. Yeah. The self surgery scene in Prometheus to me was the best scene in that whole movie because it was the first time you as an audience felt tension because the rest of the movie is bullshit. But that <laughs> moment in the movie, and even as unrealistic as it was, you're like, okay, that's fucked up. And that's how I felt with the when when he's doing the surgery on himself. Well, this whole movie had it was a rising tension. The whole and it had you know it would level, but the whole movie was a was a tension movie in my opinion. Yeah, it 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 grew with every scene. I don't know. It had a couple of humorous moments. Oh yeah, but I, it I never like when went they're boarding down. the Acheron and uh, the the surgeon's uh, helper. The what's it called? Lobby boy. I believe is is the term for his helper. Anyway, it's the round face guy who was going to yeah, do the yeah. surgery. Uh, he's boarding the Acheron, and he sees a gun about to fire, and he just puts his hand in the breach. Oh <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as it goes off, into and you his see hand. the look of pain on his yeah. face. But then somebody else kills <laughs> and, and, that guy, and he makes this little pain sound. <laughs> because yeah. you always choose the lesser of two of weevils. two weevils. <laughs> that that's the thing uh, from the books too. Is uh, one of the thing about J- Jack Aubrey is he makes. Horrible puns. I love that, that, he, that pun. He I love it. 
that he finds just hilarious and everyone else is looking at him like he told the worst knock knock joke ever. I <laughs> loved it. That was great. That's that's a, a character thing. And he, he played that to the hilt, just doubled over laughing at himself. Like I said, Russell Crowe did an amazing job doing this character. Oh. And you, you don't realize how good a job he did until you've read the books. Apparently for movie wise, uh, it's one of it is one of the worst accents for a, a character, him trying to pull off a, a British officer. I thought it was perfectly Yeah, fine. I thought, I thought it was fine. good. I thought it was good. I'm an American. Yeah. So I, I don't speak know from America. America. Yeah. <laughs> he killed seven of the king of sheriff's men. Yeah, I I I, I know I know worse. <laughs> I can I can name one. <laughs> oh really? What is that name? Kevin motherfucking Costner. There you go. Well done. fat hack, I hate you. <laughs> I just love the language, though, that they use in this movie. Should we beat to quarters? Yeah. He says, beat to quarters! Run the colors! I fucking love, I love up, I love all the language. Well, it's it's interesting because if you can run any flag you want to get close mm-hmm. to the enemy, you can be a Spaniard, you can be yeah. an American, you can be French. But before you fire that gun, if you have any sort of honor, you have to fly your colors. They have to be raised all the way and yeah. then you can blow them to hell and uh it's just it's it's one of the the little details i like i like that they give the younger characters a shitload of things to do too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like they never seem to talk down to them no nobody talked down to anybody there was the, the well there, there, there were was. implementations of station there, there was, there was there never was the, any condescension. There was the crew talking down to one of the uh, the officers. Oh, that wasn't talking it, down. That was that was, uh, that was flagrant shunning. insubordination. Yeah, that yeah. was that was straight insubordination. Was he got beat for it. He, yeah, and, and, it, it, and it's, the captain saw that shit and immediately yeah. called oh, it yeah. out. Because what is important on a ship that's discipline without women and at sea for a year? Discipline, 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 discipline. Yeah. But it was heartbreaking because it broke him so bad. I mean, the anxiety of going through everybody. He was broken from the beginning, from the very opening no, I, scene. No, I know that, but it just broke him even more. Yeah. Did you, was did he you the see one, it? Was he the one who saw the ship? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That and his, every, he was everything. always hesitant and indecisive. So, And then he took a cannonball and... You've always been kind to me and then jumped off the side of the ship. Yeah. And then the winds blew because the gods were appeased. Mm -hmm. Take your life. (laughs) So let's talk about something a little bit more pleasant. The Galapagos Island. Oh, I was hoping we would get to this part. This part. That shot where he's looking through and he just goes, oh, that's good. (laughs) It was wonderful. (laughs) I love the part where he was measured, where the doctor was measuring the the, the giant tortoises. Yeah, I know. Uh (laughs) Four, Four inches at his widest. 18 inch long neck. It was, it was great. Just they're these gentle giants are just doing their thing. Like, what the fuck are these things hanging out here? And then they're just, he's just measuring like, Oh, this new species. I need to go play. And, but yeah. even the crew had their own animals. Yeah. There was a bird, mm-hmm. the monkeys, and a monkey, mm-hmm. m- monkeys might be plural. That was, I love, I love the animals. Yeah. Um, they had a sloth in the books for a while. Uh, it did well in the ropes. It died around the Cape, though. Got too cold. No, uh, yeah. oh, that was another good God scene. God damn it, Matthew. <laughs> now there needs to be a site for, for, uh, Save the for, sloth. for Nathaniel does the sloth die.com. <laughs> does the sloth die.com. <laughs> One movie. <laughs> that's, that's it. Yeah. I really liked how they, uh, when he does go over the side, they lose the mast. Yeah. I liked, I liked the shot below as everyone's clinging and trying to get to the side mm-hmm. just to try and write it. I like that. No one's freaking out. Well, you know? they all, Discipline they, ship. Yeah. They knew this was, this was the, the risk that they took. Yeah. I, I, I like the fatalism and the lack of the importance on the individual. I, I really do. And I like that about the time, not necessarily just the military mindset, but it, it's, it's something of the time too. It's like people aren't important. Your feelings aren't important. What's important is doing this thing that we've all said we were going to do. Definitely. Yeah. I really like that shot. The first time you see the anchor dropping. Yeah. Oh, that was great. From underground. And it's just close up moving through the water. You're like, what is this? Oh, it's the anchor. And then it just keeps going on with the movie. Yep. The, it's beautiful. So, Scott, what was your favorite scene in the movie? Favorite scene in the movie? Well, where the doctor gives up his quest. While on the island. Well, on the island. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Drops his stuff and goes after Aubrey. Even after... Aubrey didn't do it for him. Aubrey did not give up his quest. He did not it kind of made his... you like the doctor a little bit more. So, mm-hmm. yeah. 
Though to be fair, Aubrey did give up his quest. He was in pursuit inside of the Acheron when he got shot, and he turned around to go to the Galapagos uh, Yeah, but it was after he got shot. Yeah, but I mean, he did kind of give up his quest for him, to be fair. That, that you know, explains the, the friendship between them. It shows it and deepens it. But uh, I, I think that they both care for each other more than they care to admit, which is something that they go into. So then, Matthew, what was your favorite scene? Oh. <sighs> I like the fight scenes. I like them a lot. <laughs> I'd say the first fight is my favorite. But if, if you're looking for just an individual moment that I like the best, his servant, Killig, there's a moment when they board and it's all hands on deck. Everyone's involved in this boarding because the Acheron is much bigger. It has more people. Yeah. So you see all the little people who do the weird little tasks like he's, he's his cook and manservant. Mm -hmm. And he's there with a big ass <laughs> fucking axe in his hand. He's, his hair is all wild. He's like, Wah! Is he the one shit. who got shot in the head first? No, no, that was that was the sailing master. Yeah, oh, we're talking guy. about his personal servant who's always muttering at him. He had the which it's ready off. when yeah. it's ready. Yeah, he was great. Yeah, Dusty. Honestly, I I think I'd have to go with on Galapagos Island when the doctor comes to, and he he looks through the tent flaps and everybody's playing cricket. I thought that was a great scene. <laughs> I like that they were brewing cactus too. They're oh yeah, like, yeah. Basically, alcohol. <laughs> we're on land. <laughs> that whole or alcohol. That whole scene that there, was really know, cool. Was, was I yeah. think my favorite, and I think a, an honorable mention, just in in for on a visual side, uh, would have been when they when they're going so far south that the the ship has snow and ice on it, and they're playing they're, they're playing snowball snowballs. fight. Yeah. yeah. So that's an honorable mention, I think. Cool. Yeah, that How was about such you? a quick shot too, I but it, it really establishes a feeling, and they're so good at that in this movie. I I, I kind of want to read the book series, but you should. I have, Matthew well, has all of them. I, well, I, I mean, know. digitally, <laughs> I I have a physical stack of books that I need to get through, plus a digital stack. On yeah, my... but none of those are as important as this. Yeah. You can just throw those away. <laughs> are, is the series done? Book yes. Oh yeah, uh, he's he's well and truly dead. <laughs> oh okay, I didn't know this because I I have this weird thing with reading books. I don't like getting into a series when all the books aren't aren't done. Like I never read That's the fair. Wheel of Time series because. I haven't because I didn't want to wait, and I haven't read um, Game of Thrones yet because all the books aren't out. Oh, they're, well, this they're is, done. <laughs> this doesn't. This isn't like that where any book could be the last book. Okay, because it's not like oh stuff and this ha you know it's a continuation of the story. Each book is a story. Oh, so it's not, like nothing harkens back to another. It's kind of like sharp. Yeah, well, the, yeah. The, the books will talk about stuff that happened in the past, mm -hmm. but you know it won't be like oh and then you know something. The, the book ends and you need to wait for the next book to come out to, to see oh, what happens. Okay. Now, each book is a, is a story, is a self-contained story. All right. I'll have, maybe I'll have to look into those. Like it should be. I oh. would say my favorite <laughs> scene is the first one. That, to me, had more tension than anything else in the rest of the film. The whole, is it there? Is it not? Did yeah. he imagine it? Because we've already immediately seen him as questionable. Is he jumpy? I saw it. But did he really see it? Yeah, I like yeah. it that everyone backs him, too. Yeah. It's like, okay, I don't trust you at all. But in order to keep this thing working, I'm, we're going to act like you did. And he was right. Yeah. And that whole scene, the fight, the the demonstration of the military efficiency of the crew, the first time you actually see Russell Crowe, when he's coming out of his cabin and he's mm -hmm. walking through and everyone is there ready. It's like in the Three Musketeers. Yeah. When the British, what's his name? When he's coming out, out of the... Buckingham. Oh, when yeah, Buckingham, yeah. Buckingham is walking yeah, through when his... When Buckingham is walking through his palace, like... But but this is a military. Everyone is right there ready. Here's your coat. Here's your hat. Here's your thing. Get ready. It's time to fight. That whole efficiency, that everything that you see the crew is doing right now, combined with the tension of yeah. fighting a much stronger, more capable foe. It's kind of the takeaway uh, of the movie. The takeaway of the movie could be construed as know your role. Because if you know your role within an organization and you're really good at it, your organization can do more than you think it is. Like, this is just floating matchsticks and gunpowder and guano and whatnot. Mm -hmm. The whole you movie know? is Tom and Jerry. <laughs> no. And they're clearly <laughs> Jerry. And they 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 beat Tom. Yeah. And then they sail away, and then they realize Tom has one last trick. And yeah. they're like, fuck! <laughs> and then they gotta sail back. And credits roll. Hi, everyone. This is your favorite host, Matthew. 
This week's episode is brought to you by Guardian Games, who we are proud to have as our sponsor. Guardian Games is Portland's largest gaming store. They have almost every game you can think of, be it role-playing, board game, card games, miniature games, even video games. They also have a ton of gaming-related material and some pretty neat swag. I mean, the D20 fuzzy dice that go in your mirror, that's good stuff. If, you, uh, <laughs> if you're 21, uh, you can have a drink in the back at the Critical Sip. Booze makes gaming better. Always has, always will. There's free games back there. You'll love it. Uh, they also have a friendly and incredibly knowledgeable staff, and they are the hub of a diverse and friendly gaming community. Um, if you're in Portland, you definitely want to go to Guardian Games. So we're back from the break, and we're going to talk about some gaming shit. One of the things that I love about this movie is that the characters are all very fascinating. So, Dusty, lead us again. Who do we have? Oh, yes. We have Russell Crowe, who plays the captain. Is it, was it Aubrey? Autry? Aubrey. Aubrey. Yes, yeah. Aubrey. Captain Aubrey. Yeah, he, Russell Crowe, if you don't know, he was in Gladiator, The Mummy, Nice Guys, Men of Steel, L.A. Confidential, and Virtuosity, to name a few. Wait, wait, wait. The Mummy? Who was he the in new the mummy? mummy? The new mummy. Oh, I didn't with, see with that one. Tom yeah, Cruise. No, that one yeah. doesn't exist. Yeah, he 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 plays um, uh, Doctor Jekyll. Yeah, Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde. It doesn't have Brendan. It's not a mummy it's, movie. It's word, dude. Deep. Brendan Fraser kicked ass in that. Yeah, he movie. was I, so good. Yeah. That was a great pulp movie. But this, as and it, I know they tried to reboot it as its own thing. It was decent. Hey, Hollywood, but, make new shit. Yes, stop rebooting old shit. I agree. You know what? We're old. I know that you want to pander to us, but we have new audiences coming and they want their own shit. So mm -hmm. stop rebooting our stuff for them to appreciate. Give them their own stories. Yes. And then we have. Well, hold on. Oh, so Russell yeah, Crowe. Russell Crowe. Me, lawful fucking good. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Scott? Jack Aubrey? Jack Aubrey is lawful good. Lawful good in every way whatsoever. Yeah. He is clearly a man of military order. He is clearly established in the law of his country, and he is a good person. Yeah. I don't ever see him doing anything evil. He weighs every decision heavily. He fucks his admiral's wife a lot in the books, but not in the movie. So I, I have to agree. <laughs> yeah, in, in, the, in the movie, it made it made it seem like he is very, you know, focused on his wife and he's very honorable and, and nothing on the side, but I to our wives and mistresses. Yeah. <laughs> May they never meet. May they never meet. <laughs> and then we have Paul Bettany. Uh, Paul Bettany, as we discussed earlier, he, um, well, Paul Bettany actually plays Dr. Stephen, uh, Maturin. I think that's how you pronounce it. I think it. so too, but I've never, like I said, I've never heard it. In my brain, it's always been Maturin. Yeah. But I don't know. Cause we know how I love to have, pronounced on this, correctly on everything. this side in fact if anyone does know could, you, know. could, could yeah, you leave that please. in the comments yeah. or just say hey you're fucking wrong and you say it like this because <laughs> i honestly i just read 21 books on this subject and i still don't know how to say his name so one of my fa as a kid one of my favorite book series ever up to uh their next generation was the dragon lance series he's also catalan spanish if that affects the pronunciation okay. at all. Uh, one of my favorite characters i I pronounced it as Sturm. Sturm. It's Sturm. Sturm. And it's stayed Sturm in my head. But it's one syllable. I know it's Sturm. I know. I know. And everybody tells That's me okay. wrong. I know I'm wrong. No, it's okay. Okay. Dusty, we're just Dritz we're or used Drizzit? To this with you. <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of people say Drizzit. It's Drizzed. Yeah. I always thought it was Drizzit. It's Drizzt. Drizzit sounds better, but it's Dritz. It's okay. Drizzed. All right. Yep. Paul Bettany has played, like I said uh, before the break, uh, The Vision and the MCU. He's played in The Knight's Tale, A Beautiful Mind, Priest, and Inkheart. I would I, say neutral good. I'm going to go with lawful good as well. Reason being is he's following his own code. He yeah. has no country allegiance. He just has a particular, His he is Jack Aubrey's particular friend, and he will go to the ends of the earth for him. Uh, he follows his own code, even at his own detriment. So I, I have to add lawful to that. I'm going with lawful good too. Yeah, I can see that. I can concede lawful good personally because I think lawful good is the best alignment. Yeah. I think most people I know, except Matthew, are lawful good. And I even think Matthew himself is lawful good. He just refuses to admit it. I think I may self sabotage a bit just so I don't yep. fall into the paladin category. There's, <laughs> you know, there's, I think a lot okay, of people do. There's lawful good and then there's paladins. <laughs> there's a difference. <laughs> it's true. And we have Billy Boyd. 
who is most notably known for being in the Lord of the Rings series, but he was also in the Moby Dick series, a uh, version of Macbeth, and also in Seed of Chucky. So he was in the Lord of the Rings series, the third movie of which was against this one at the Academy Awards. You are correct. Yeah. You are correct, sir. So he was in two different Academy Award winning movies in the same year. Well, Good on him. Russell Crowe uh, split halfway through doing this movie filming so he could fly out and because Richard Harris from Gladiator, who who was his um, basically his, when he was a slave, he played his owner. Uh, and and because he he passed away, so he went to that funeral. But yeah, there were a couple there were a couple things that happened during this movie. But yes, you are correct. He was he was on two different films at the same time. Fantastic! And Return of the King being one of my favorite fucking movies. Oh God, the tears. Anyway, so Billy Boyd. Oh, honestly, he's, he's in it. He's basically an NPC. Uh, most yeah. everybody aside from Paul Bettany and Russell Crowe. And the kid, Lord The, the Black- one-armed kid. Yeah, that's Max Perkis, who I'll get to. They were all pretty much NPCs, in my opinion. And I would say they're vastly lawful good, with the mm-hmm. exception of the one who broke discipline for his own personal. Even uh, the suicide was lawful good. Yeah. He was, he, I mean, everyone. Everything was basically a matter of your alignment versus your character traits. Yeah. Your merits and flaws, so to speak. The guy who broke ritual or broke uh, protocol Mm -hmm. he could have been lawful good but he probably had a uh disrespects authority kind of character yeah i i I could see everyone in this i mean in order to survive on a king ship you're you're lawful you you have to otherwise you will get eaten alive whipped to death and then thrown over the side and nobody did anything overtly evil no Everybody seem the 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 only characters that I think that could be seen as even neutral in nature. The cook seemed very <laughs> oh Killick, yeah. He did not really seem to give a shit about anything, but the food. Yeah, the guy who you said what the the captain's uh, like his a, steward, basically, his yeah, steward Killick. who was like, Bruh! yeah, that guy I would say could be lawful neutral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I I could see that. He wasn't necessarily good. In fact, he in the books, he gets into trouble a lot. He he looked like a character that yeah. would get into trouble a so, lot. So, yeah, going from the movies, forgetting what you know about yeah. the books, but looking at the movie and looking at the characters, just Neutral from good. what you know of the movie, but then extrapolating. Extrapolating from the movie what you think those characters might become. I could see Paul Bettany's character. I could see Maturin being neutral good, not necessarily so lawful, especially knowing that he was a spy and had some some, somewhat, uh, he had some dalliances in other affairs. Oh, no, not him. No, he didn't get laid much. He was really? uh, Yeah, in fact, uh, in... uh, in the movie, he has a much thicker head of hair than he does in the uh, oh, really? in the books. He's like <laughs> patchy and balding and remarkably I have to ugly. Read these books. They're really good. <laughs> well, we've established something about the characters, and as we have begun to do over the last few episodes, Matthew, lead us lead us into what you think the game should be. So this one is remarkably easy because they were setting it up for a sequel, and as as we all saw at the end of the movie. Uh, the Acheron sailing off with Tom Pulling. Oh, we didn't do Tom Pullings. Who? His his right hand man, the lieutenant with the ponytail, who is the captain at the end that mm. he sends off in the prize. I honestly don't remember most of the cast. <laughs> like, Tom Pullings is that guy. guy. Yeah, he's he's actually really important in the rest of the stories, but that's okay. neither here nor there. So at the movie's end. Well, hold on. Where in the saga does this movie take place? All over it. Okay, the Acheron. Never existed. Never happened in the books. Yeah, no, but does that guy get his own command in the books? Pullings? Yeah. Yes. Does he pull it off? Yes. Okay. Then I can rest assured that this movie is meant to tell me that they intercept them and he's fine. You you can say that, yeah. Okay. Um I, I wondered if I should bring that up as don't worry, hits he's fine. <laughs> he's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this one was really easy because at the movie's end, Aubrey realizes that the captain of the Acheron is still alive still on board his ship and that captain or because that ship has an actual captain maybe mm-hmm. lieutenant pullings is in mortal danger uh captain pullings will of course be taken by surprise a prize crew that he puts across from uh, the surprise is only like 20 people and there are still hundreds of people left on the acheron 
the Acheron, the prisoners, well, yeah, was yeah, but you need a lot to sail that ship. You cannot do it with twenty people. So Captain Pullings will be taken by surprise by this wily frosh captain. <laughs> um, oh, 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 oh. However, Captain Pullings is no idiot himself. He is a very, very skilled lieutenant by this time. Which I'm, I'm just kind of guessing by this time in the series, though. He's just about to be promoted, and this is literally at the height of his powers before he becomes captain. This guy is no fool. So, yeah. Pullings... And he studied under Aubrey. Aubrey, yeah, who studied under Nelson. Nelson, so yeah. I, that, that's, that's two points removed from Nelson. That's not bad. <gasps> um, <laughs> so, he will be taken by surprise because he has no knowledge that the captain is still alive and still on board. That captain, as masquerading as the surgeon, can quite easily take control of his ship that was a great moment of subterfuge by oh the way. yeah however captain pullings Had might be able to manage a fighting retreat to the tops which is the fighting deck where you see all the marines firing down in the in the ship battles um if he can manage to get his people up to the fighting top he can effectively control the deck and they can't get at him without climbing the rigging so the way i have this written is pullings will immediately once the uprising starts take his men and run the fuck up to the tops, attempting to take control of them, which he will succeed in. So hold on, hold on. You're setting the stage for the game that we're about to play. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's right at the end of the movie. You see Aubrey take off after the Acheron, which you can see in the distance. It's within sight. Yeah. So in this, the game that you're proposing, this campaign, this whatever, this follow-up begins, who are we playing? Oh, you'll be playing... Uh, PCs with Captain Pullings. Gotcha. So we're on the Acheron. The Acheron. Yeah, you yeah, are okay. on the Acheron. He and 20 surviving men must hold the top against all comers, but their supply of powder and shot is running low. Thankfully, they have their swords. Uh, as the French captain attempts to settle his ship and capture Lieutenant Pullings, Jack Aubrey draws within one nautical mile, which is the uh, extreme range of his uh, chase armament, which are the two cannons you will see in the front, mm -hmm. which are his uh, long 12-pounders. The surprise mounts a pair of long 12s. <laughs> 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 I've been waiting for that one. Uh, that's barely in range of the Acheron, but he can hit at that range. And as we can see, as he trains his gun crew, they're actually fairly skilled at this point. Uh, at this moment of confusion, a third sail is spotted. Ooh, of the French album. sloop Victory, 24 guns, Aubrey will have to fight both ships in order to save Pullings and regain his prize. He has one advantage, though. With Pullings in the top, the French captain can't fight or steer from the quarter deck effectively. There are no sails being adjusted because they can shoot down. They have control of the Acheron, but they don't have control of the guns, which are below decks. <laughs> so you have a force above and a massive ship which can obliterate Aubrey in a stand-up fight, but that can't steer effectively. The PC should be with Pullings in a desperate standoff, unable to get down and take the ship because they're vastly outnumbered, but in a position to control the decks, which means there's no steering from the wheel, though something could be done with the rudder. Uh, there are no changes to the sail, no stern chasers on the Acheron. I don't know what that means. Clarify. Stern chasers are guns that are on deck, not below through the gun ports that okay. you always see flapping yeah, open yeah. up so dramatically. Uh, their chasers are for a chase. There's usually two in front, two in back. They're, yeah, they're like the, the 10 to 12 pounders that are like you can swivel, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. But below decks, the Acheron's huge guns can still fight and they will. Okay. And there's one more small French ship pulling up that's about the same size and weight as the surprise. Okay. So I think that would be really interesting because one of the overlying themes of this is tension. And this is a very tense moment. You can, you could win this, especially because you can't steer the Acheron. Not with pullings there. Mm -hmm. So Jack Aubrey could conceivably do that. But the PCs are going to have to hold against 10 times their weight of men, which I think is very interesting. They have the high ground, though. So I think that would be a very fun little little game to play. I know the perfect game to pull that off. Yeah, what and you that got? game is Savage Worlds. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked oh. about Savage Worlds many times, but what you have just described is to me, well, I'm going to steal that idea from you and run it as a one shot at a convention sometime because that, that is awesome. That is a fantastic 
one shot game to set up and start the party in media res. All right. You are this captain's crew and you have to defend this ship that you have just taken. And now there's a gunfight happening between two other ships and you need to prevent the insurrection crew from taking over the ship and firing those guns at your ally. There's Go. an interesting side note to this too. Um, because the captain didn't declare himself and because the Acheron is technically a privateer, Aubrey doesn't have to give quarter. He doesn't have to reaccept a surrender. He could literally blow the Acheron out of the water. But he doesn't he, want to. No, he, 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 he wants, he wants that. Show. Well, not only that, show. but he wants the prize money. They never really go into it in the movie, but one of the overlying things is the prize money. If you bring a ship back, there is a good chance that you your that ship will be bought by your government, repaired, and sent right back out as a British ship. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of money. Yeah. Lots of money. And he does talk. Well, the intro to the movie, the text overlay does talk about their mission. Take her as a prize. Take yeah. Her as a prize. And, and everybody else is talking about, you know, how much wealth is, you know, in the storage areas of that ship. And how modern the ship is and how yeah. great it would be if it could be recommissioned. Yeah. Heavier and faster because, you know, they were looking at the model and, and how it was, how it was constructed. Yeah. So it's, it's, what's that book? Oh. It's rating, it's rating the whaling ships. So it has all the, Whale oil, which is very, which is, which is the vast treasure. Yeah. Clean burning lamp oil. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, we've already established the themes. We've talked about them heavily. We have military chain of command. We have order. We have discipline. We have martial readiness and we have the age of sail. I want to talk about the age of sail for a moment. If you are a modern day gamer nerd, who is, unlike Matthew, not steeped in nautical lore, you may find the Age of Sail to be vastly interesting, but also technically overwhelming. I would. One of my favorite writers is a fellow named Scott Lynch, and he wrote a book that I love called The Lies of Luck Amora. Oh, it's such a good book series. It is a fantastic series. The first book is amazing, mm -hmm. and the second book is mm -hmm. also pretty fucking cool. And now here's what he himself notes from his writing of the second book. He involves a significant amount of the nautical fiction. The characters are on a boat, and he had to make all that shit up on the fly. He himself is not a sailor. He has no background in sailing. He has himself no ability to sail he does not understand Neither did the, the author of these books actually but he consulted with someone oh, yeah. who basically was like don't write that write this yeah. and don't do this don't do that but aside from that he basically kind of went with it and worked with the characters in in a he focused more on the characters being in an alien situation which to them was sailing whereas they were urban characters if you are a game master you might experience something that I have experienced wanting to run an Age of Sail kind of game. That is, having no familiarity whatsoever with nautical terms. <laughs> <laughs> Running such a game is difficult. You have to try and focus entirely on the characters and just sort of let all of the sailing bullshit become the background. Unless, of course, you're into that stuff in which, you know, run the game that you want to run. I'm going to tell this from the perspective of somebody who doesn't know shit about sailing and has successfully run sailing games. Also, if you get something wrong, if you call a one of the one of your officers a bosun or the quartermaster and they're that's not what their technical job is. That's the purser. Nobody mm -hmm. cares. Nobody cares. No, so I care just, a little. <laughs> just just leave it as it is. That's how it is in your world and, and go on. Adapting that kind of a military naval structure to a game as somebody who is unfamiliar with the truth of the matter, again, you got to hand wave a lot of it. You just got to sit down before you start to play the game. You got to have a conversation with everybody like, look, we all like boats. <laughs> we like sailing. We like, you know, I like caught myself a couple buckling. of times calling it a boat during this podcast and I winced every time I did. I'm a very bad person and I want you to know that I realized I fucked up, but I'm sorry. But I'm calling it a boat because <laughs> it's on the water. And it's <laughs> fuck. If it's on the water and it carries people, in my opinion, it's a boat and, and I'm wrong. But like you, <laughs> I'm not the best. <laughs> 
when it comes to being a source of knowledge for sailing games. So go with what you know and all the stuff that you don't know. Don't worry about it so much. Yeah, have fun with it. Let it fall into the background. Let it become the color so that everybody can share a fiction that they all appreciate. So to that end, the first game I want to talk about is a game that I am vastly familiar with, and that is Savage Worlds, specifically the Pirates of the Spanish Main campaign setting. The reason I bring this up is that it has all of the rules, as you have talked about, Dusty and Matthew, throughout this session, about the multiple pounders, the eight pounders, the 12 pounders, the 16 pounders. It has rules for combat at sea. And it is also tied directly to the, unfortunately, no longer with us, collectible, punchable card game of the pirates, where you had the little cards and you punched out and you built ships and you made them fight each other. I have friends that were really into that. I I have hundreds of them now. (laughs) This is the role-playing game inspired by those card games, by the little punchable card ships that you could make fight each other. It is a fantastic game if you know Savage Worlds. And Scott played in one of my favorite campaigns that I've ever run, which we called Sea and Shores, which was directly inspired by my first viewing of this movie. (laughs) Excellent. It was a fantastic campaign. I really loved it. It We, Our whole thing was that we would meet uh, twice a month and we would play for about six to eight hours each session. And it was, uh, we had five, four or five players. Five players. And each player made two characters. We specific, my rule was, I want you to each make two characters. One of those characters, at least, must be willing and able to go off ship. You must be able, you know, the away team. I want mm-hmm. an away team and I want a ship team. So we focus back and forth between That's interesting. going off to islands that they discovered versus dealing with politics on the ship and the the minutiae of running a sailing ship an exploratory vessel i don't think we had we didn't have the the captain was an npc i think the captain should be an npc i just i'm just i would trying to recall like the, wasn't the i think the captain was an npc i think the captain was an npc yeah. i don't remember the captain at all neither do i <laughs> like, like the second in command was a pc we had another officer who was secretly the son of the captain uh, i pl- one of my characters was the major- honestly scott you're t- scott played two characters who were my favorite two characters in the campaign uh, so my 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 what i consider my primary character was major houston and he was the commander of the marines mr houston mr houston he's a major but yeah mr houston he was the commander of the marines and then- so mr houston one of his edges was that he had a sidekick and the sidekick all that sidekick did was reload his gun <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yeah, Mr. Houston was really good at shooting stuff. <laughs> so he had a guy who just followed him around, and he would pass him a gun, and then he would draw another one. And while he was firing one gun, the other guy would be reloading his other. Because, again, these are the Age of Sail era guns, where one does not just gun, gun, gun. Mm-hmm. You gun, pass it over, reload, and then you fire your second you or third amazing, gun. Yeah. You can reload in 50 seconds. If you're amazing. Well, a combat round is six. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and we had a, we call him the quartermaster, but really he was the burst. But he had the guy in charge of like the stock, yeah. the stuff. And mm-hmm. he was a spy. And he was a spy. <laughs> he was great. Well, he knows where to hide um, the stuff at least. <laughs> and, and the character that his wife, player's wife played, and I don't remember she what. Played she played two. She played two. I don't remember. Oh, she, she played, she played the, um, basically the carpenter. She played the guy That's who fixed right. things. She played the general carpenter, the master mechanic of the ship. Yep. And but she also played the uh, just just a like a like a like a female botanist on the expedition. She basically played the female version of Maturin, right? Who yeah. was there following her patron, who was this weird ass dude who funded the whole trip. Yeah, who turned out to be uh, insane. And the whole premise of this campaign was an alternate history exploration of the South American coast in the 1700s around the same time as all of that Napoleonic era stuff was happening. It was fantastic. We delved deeply into folklore, but also 
in our own way, in enough fashion to satisfy those in the group who were into nautical fiction, mm-hmm. we kind of we brought it. It was a fun game. Nice. Yeah, it really was. It yeah. was the for me, it was the game that got away. It ended unfortunately the the there there was some upheaval in the group. I wish that I could do that game again. That is my number one campaign that failed. Yeah. And I'm sad. Yeah. I'm just saying, I'll, I'll play if you ever want to run it again. Let's make it. I'll, 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 <laughs> I, I got the time. I, there was a couple of things I really liked about the campaign. One was there was also a one shot before the campaign, which took place like 20 years before the campaign. I, I don't remember. The Vikings. I, 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 don't, I don't remember what the time frame was. Oh, my God. That's right. So, we did an so, alternate history game. Yeah. And one so, of the characters was a Viking whaler. Oh, yes. That was. That <laughs> I was forgot out, about him. But there was a one shot that took place before, which was like the Vikings coming over to the new world. Yeah. And finding out that it's, you know. It's, fucking magical. <laughs> it, it's fucking magical. Don't go there. And like. And. and 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 that was really cool because basically everybody died except for one NPC that ran away. Yeah. A nice and Shakespearean That ending. NPC's ancestor was one of the sailors on the ship. Yep. He was oh, wow. he, nice. He actually he was actually my second in command. It, it's nice to if you can manage it to be referential between campaigns. It it yeah. adds it, it, of, it adds yeah, a certain amount. As a writer, I think that's always good to connect, yeah. have a reference. I try and connect every campaign I run. <laughs> I'd be interested to see your meta world chart <laughs> for <laughs> Nathaniel's games. No, it worked out really well because it yeah. turned out like for the first th- campaign, like when they found is they, they ran into werewolves, like they and everybody basically got eaten yeah. and destroyed. Mm-hmm. And so this as Vikings do this. Yeah. This guy's lineage is like, you know, werewolves are the worst thing you can find. And he was all about them. And then during the course of the game, Mr. Houston became a werewolf <laughs> uh, and, and had to hide it. You know, he, he's yeah. like, I, you know, I'm in charge and my second command will absolutely kill me if I, he finds out that this is what I am. Uh, but I also liked it is when I turned into a werewolf, I just picked up my character sheet and handed it to the DM. <laughs> nice. Right. Because like, I'm not in charge of it anymore. Mm-hmm. Like, you're doing what's going on. So, it, which is, t- I was like, absolutely 100% cool with like, that's how it went. Because the werewolf was extremely powerful. I shouldn't be in charge. Like, yeah. Like, it was very you go. powerful. Yeah. What, uh, Sarah, Sarah, your friend, uh, uh, mutual friend, Sarah, yeah. she played in that game. She played uh, an Egyptian princess. Part and, of the, and the second in command. Yeah. The story was that there was, uh, again, it was alternate history. And in this alternate history, the uh, Africas were never conquered. So they were allowed to foster into their own nation and they were great and powerful. So we had an African, uh, an Egyptian princess mm-hmm. who was part of the ship as the second in command. When did you, when did you? No, 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 no. The Egyptian princess and the second command were two her two characters. Oh, they were different characters. Okay, when did you run this one? Oh my god, this was at least five or six years ago. Oh, okay, yeah, right at least you were at least like at least eight. you were living at the yeah. Hawthorne house at that time. But yeah, when you were living was actually not far too. from here. Actually, yeah. I like that house. Well, so did I. <laughs> sorry, I remember we we did Red Sonia over yeah, at that house. No, it was yeah, I like that house a lot. One thing that I really liked about that game is uh, I did another storytelling technique where at the very end of our first like eight hour session, I devoted the last hour. I decided to change it up. So we'd been playing. We'd been establishing these characters. We'd been kind of building into the whole ship, how we're, you know, becoming accustomed to where we're staying in the ship. I, I drew out the ship and I had each person like, where do you sleep? Okay, what what part of the crew are you in? Who are your friends? Let's give them some names. Let's right. start to build out. I actually had a list of, uh, I forget, like four dozen people that were on this ship. And as we played the game, I would fill out these lists of people that had been named that would fill out the roles of the ship. So I knew how many people were on there. I just didn't know their names or who they were. And then at the end of the first session, we had about an hour to go. I said, okay, we're going to flash forward to an unnamed time in the future. You are now on the Tierra del Fuego. The ship that you were on is burning in the ocean. The volcano at the tip of the Tierra is on fire. 
and you are being hounded by creatures. You are wearing a nightgown. You have only a stick in your hands. You are wearing, roll the die, full armor. Congratulations, <laughs> you have everything. Now we have to work backwards from here. And it changed everything. Right, Suddenly, great. everybody at the table knew that shit was going to get real <laughs> at some point in the future. And so I kept working backwards from there. And mm -hmm. I, my goal was to have the two storylines intersect with the hope that the players knew what was coming and they would themselves try and Make orchestrate yeah. ways for that to happen. Yeah. How did that exactly. work out? Did, did, it, did it work out? That there were... was relationship drama in the group. I understand about uh, that. Yep. And mm -hmm. then it fell apart. Yeah. But I mean, in, in the context of, of that one game, were they able to work backwards to that point? It was looking that way. Oh, oh and then did, yeah. it, did it erupt at the table? Yeah. Oh, well, no, no, well, oh. no, it erupted behind the scenes. The short version is that one of the players who was pushing the whole espionage and uh, story stuff and behind the scenes and intrigue so much, then complained to me about there being too much intrigue oh. and then bailed out. And then the person they were with bailed out and then that ended the game. Right. Yeah. Oh, it's that's like, too bad. Well, there's as much intrigue of you have brought to the table. <laughs> <laughs> what, was, what was crazy is the intrigue was there wasn't any, like, like on uh, for my character, like any of the intrigue that was involved with that character. I had no idea. Like the only intrigue, my my the only intrigue my Mister Houston was involved in was don't let people find out you're a werewolf. Huh, of course, and, but you also had another character. I had another character who was completely mysterious. <laughs> um, who who I I ended up I I know a lot of the backstory yeah. of that character, which would never came out. He was Uncle Babatunde, Uncle Babatunde, and he was a very small little African American old man who lived somewhere in the, sh in the bowels of the ship. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, like he would just, Oh, there he is. And then, Oh, he's going to sleep. Uh, where did he go? I don't know. Like he just, yeah. he goes to sleep. So, uh, and he was, he was a magic user. I mean, or like for lack of a better word, he's more like a, like, like a, a shaman. shaman. Okay. If you're shaman. familiar with savage worlds, he had an arcane background. Yeah. Wizard. Yeah. I agree, but yeah. So he was a, he was a shaman, but all, and all of his stuff was, was nautical themed. Everything mm -hmm. was very nautical themed. And his story is, he grew up in the West Indies where the ship was built. So the ship is a new belt that was built in the West Indies. This yep. was part of the thing is, is it, you know, it was one of the first ships built there in the West Indies. The He's ship like, had actually been commissioned, commissioned by yeah. its patron yeah. who died a horrible uh, and painful and well-deserved death in the so, fourth or fifth episode so, of the campaign. Yeah. So he grew up there in the West Indies. And ended up building ships as he grew up. And then as the colonials showed up, he worked for them building their ships. But he was basically but, part of the ship. But he ended up basically becoming part of the ship because he had ties with the trees that made the ship. And so he was yeah. tied to the spirit of the ship. He was the queen. He got way. a little, he got a little <laughs> druided. Basically, <laughs> he was the druid of the ship. Yeah, sounds good. I so like that. One of my favorite moments. He of that rarely game. left the ship. He rare, like, like actually, one time he left the ship, and it actually didn't work out very well for him. <laughs> and he decided, I'm not going to leave the ship anymore. <laughs> one of Mistake. my favorite moments is that. So, Savage Worlds, if you play a magician, you have what are called trappings of your spells. So, Savage Worlds has a very slim spell list, and it is up to the players and the GM to describe the spells and to work those spells into your various game. You know, you have bolt and you have blast and you have burst, but one person might know fire bolt. Another person might know right. ice bolt. You might know acid bolt or whatever. Yeah. Or bees, you know, or like bees. It, yeah. You know, it's, yes. yeah, it's kind of bravest warriors. <laughs> bees <laughs> to the eyeballs. <laughs> yeah. Baba Tunde's spells were all like manifestations of him. So he created this confusion spell. And that was one of my favorite moments of the entire game was Baba Tunde casted a confusion spell, which manifested as millions of tiny little Uncle Baba Tunde's <laughs> <That's, laughs> leaping all over the place. That's actually not quite how it was. Oh, okay. R refresh so, me. So it was it was the fear spell. Okay. It was fear. And he, he, he pulls out a little, little piece of rope and starts and ties a little man, little rope man. So it's like a little guy yeah. who's like six inches, but it's like 
rope arms and stuff. And then that guy just multiplies and ru- and they start running all over, grabbing and, and at people mm-hmm. as these little rope men humunculi. are like, yeah, rope humunculi are like like attacking everyone. And since fear, <laughs> you know, <laughs> these things, it, fears, you know, it's like it's a very vague thing. But it got to be well, like these things existed. It wasn't like you thought they existed; they did exist, and you either were or weren't afraid of them. Uh, but then it got really cool when the when the other magic user fireballed everybody mm-hmm. and so then you had little flaming rope men running around <laughs> <laughs> that was that was wow yeah. ah! so we played that using savage worlds mm-hmm. and the pirates of the spanish main campaign setting this campaign setting has everything that you really need if you want to run a nautical fishing style game using savage worlds which is one of the most versatile kind of adventure games out there it has trade it has currencies it has rules for different classes of ships it has rules for different styles of guns it has rules for incorporating the little miniature punchable cards it has everything that you might want to run that style of game it is a very traditional style with 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 yes with, very with, pulpy yeah with with individual combats and you know it's very i don't know how else to say it other than traditional, but <laughs> it, you know. it, it's savage world savage yeah. worlds is what many people consider to be the mainstream alternative to like d20 that being said i have done uh a nautical campaign in d20 um I, I, using just yeah. and it worked out great uh it wasn't quite master and commander but one of the things from the movie is just you you pay attention to all the details and personally my take on it is it's not a game of broad strokes it is a game of planning for a brief moment hours and hours and hours and hours of planning for your attack sucking every advantage you can to your own aid and we played something very similar very well in uh d20 however Mm-hmm. The game that I ultimately want to talk about is one that Scott here introduced me to. So good. Scott? Uh, it is a game called Duty and Honor, which is a Napoleonic role-playing game written by Neil Gao. In, he's English, and, he's, and he has a sequel called Beat to Quarters, oh. which is the Napoleonic sailing uh, role-playing. Beat to Quarters! Um, I really like these because they are non-traditional. There isn't like man to man combat. You describe the mission and you succeed on the mission and everyone's like, this is my role in the mission and you, there's degrees of success and it's card based. There's no dice. It's How does that work? Great. You take read, a joke. Read the, the books. <laughs> <laughs> read the books. It's been, it's been, a, it's been a while since I've, I've looked at the, you, you've recently read them. Maybe you can fill in, but you get, you get a number of cards depending on your, what is it? It's skills. You get a number of cards based on the challenges. Uh, there, there's a lot of different ways, yeah. but it's basically uh, getting a bunch of cards into your hand and ways to do that. And then you're playing out the success of each situation based on what the cards you have add up to, I believe. So I'm a big but, fan of playing card-based role-playing games. Dusty, have you played any card-based games? Yeah, there have been a few. Not many. Matthew? What, what, I have 20 pounds of dice and I'll never give them up. Cold dead hands. Yeah, <laughs> I have a very large collection of dice. So my my card games have been a few, but not many. So yeah. one of the things that I love about card-based games is that you can walk into any gas station and buy a deck of cards. Mm-hmm. You can't always buy dice. Like Deadlands is my is my biggest go-to card version, like the first edition of, of it has, Deadlands. It is a dice-based game, yeah, but, but I you, do like the card-based mechanics. Yeah, is that, that. Is, so are you asking on that level or like... That's fine. Yeah, okay. that's perfect. Yeah, okay. And Deadlands Savage Worlds, Pinnacle, who created Deadlands, then created Deadlands Reloaded, which mm-hmm. is the Savage Worlds version of Deadlands, but they still kept... Savage Worlds uses playing cards for initiative. Which I love the initiative mechanic in Savage Worlds. To date, it is my favorite published initiative system. But in Deadlands, for the Huckster characters, I love the Huckster the, Huckster character. The gambler magicians, you deal yourself a hand of poker cards, mm-hmm. and basically every time you cast the spell, you make a deal with the devil. And depending upon your hand, your spell might be different, or it might fuck you. That's pretty cool. So yeah, but well, have you played a game entirely using cards other than Munchkin? No. 
All right. Now, <laughs> so the other non-traditional part of duty and honor and beat to quarters is uh, your stats, which he calls measures. So traditional stats like you know strength, intelligence, dexterity, whatever. Here you have four stats, and they're two physical and two social. So guts and discipline are your physical stats, and influence and charm are your social stats. You're like, well, like, well, how do I wield a sword? That's not part of the game. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's it's more about positioning and the fiction. Yeah, following it to where it seems to lead. I just read most of Beat Quarters before this because I was, I, I love the era, I love the setting, yeah, and I, I found it to be a fascinating game. I think I'd have a slight, like an hour learning curve uh-huh. to get into it, but a one shot would totally cure me of that. Yeah, just, it's just a quick one shot. It's the originality that really draws me to it. It's not like the other stuff, yeah. which will allow you to do things that typically aren't in the other games. It allows you to think outside of the dungeon crawl box. Yeah. Yeah. You don't look at your character so much as a, what can I do? But you look at them instead as a, how can I influence the situation in a way that benefits me? And that's something that I love about a lot of story games. Like we've talked about other more story based games. Like remember when we talked about Meridian? That yeah. was a weird one. Mm-hmm. But that one fills this niche. Like it, it, it approaches character in less of a, how can I kill that thing? And more of a, what does this situation mean to me at this moment in time? And how can I, how can I master this moment? I love that. Yeah, this is way outside my normal comfort zone of role playing because, you know, it's it's not Palladium and it's not being here. <laughs> so, but that being said, I would I would love to play this just because of the setting and yeah, I'm 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 actually like seriously, if you if you ever run something like this again, I, I want in. I really do. Speaking of Palladium. Yeah. Palladium you always make him happy with that. Has a book the third book in the palladium fantasy series both in first edition and in second edition called adventures on the high seas i've got it on my shelf it is what you expect it is a way to play palladium fantasy role-playing game with a nautical fiction approach it has characters such as the sailor the acrobat the prestidigitator whatever that means in your game i love palladium let let it be known that <laughs> throughout the lens, Matthew and I are big fans of Palladium simply for nostalgia's sake. But if you are into Palladium, the High Seas Adventure could pull this off, and it is rich. It has multiple ship types. It has naval combat rules. If that's something you're interested in, and you happen to like Palladium as well as at least two of our three normal hosts mm-hmm. do... Check that out. One of the reasons I think this is the winner, Beat to Quarters, as opposed to all the other uh, naval combat ones, is that it's direct in the setting. I mean, it's it's right there. If you're looking to play Master and Commander, it's, it's, that's, it's, it's that's right the here. Game, this, right there. this is the game. Yeah. The now, game opens up yeah. talking about... Yeah. It is literally steeped there there's there's it, it is there there isn't a contest because i'm big on setting i i don't i care less about oh, so far uh, the mechanics and i i always care about the world and this is that world to a t and i mean it, it's it's a clear winner I, everything else is honorable mention and it probably is more based on pirates because for some reason unbeknownst to me pirates get people hard i have no idea why yeah Fucking pirates! Even well, the you, Savage you can, Worlds game that I'm pitching here is a pirates game. Well, yeah. you can you can thank the you pirates know, are Disney, there to be killed. You can really thank the, the resurgence because yeah. of Disney and Pirates of the Caribbean. So, well, Disney has a lot to answer for. <laughs> you know, okay, pirates. I think it was the fourth movie. The on I, Stranger I, Tides I stopped mm-hmm. at the second. On Stranger yeah, Tides second, was based horrible. on a book. Yes, a called great Stranger book. Tides. Yes. On Stranger Tides by Tim Powers. Mm-hmm. It's a great An amazing book. book. Not yes. a Pirates of the Spanish or Caribbean nope. book. They co opted it. They bought the license of it. They inserted Jack Sparrow into it and they jerked off all over it and <laughs> turned it into a horrible, horrible Disney bullshit. Now, I, I had I had a conversation with a friend of mine here recently and we were going to go see Red Sparrow and we did. This you know has nothing to do with what the game we're talking about, or the movie we're talking about, 
but it's a spy movie. And she asked me as a writer if, like, if my like if my book got uh, licensed, would I be okay with that? And and, and it's a it's a weird yes. It's hump a, the money tree, Dusty. Yeah, no, 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 no. I agree. Tree. Yes, I will. There was a time where I was like, you know, only if you stay true to it. But now, as a oh, as, for as fuck's sake, I know. Hey, anyone out there? I will sell out. I will pitch anything you want. Men's diapers, whatever. Send me a check. So yes, I would happily take that that licensing contract of let's say one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to license my book. Yeah. Okay. Sure, or even great. just to option. Yeah, just to option it. And then, I mean, there's a part of me that would be very upset and brokenhearted if they. I mean, they Valerian happened. It. You got a shot, man. <laughs> if they changed it, but at the same time, my my shit's now on the screen, and people are going to be buying my books, and it's a win win for me. There's a writer whose name I can no longer remember. This quote being attributed to it could be Terry Brooks. It might be the late, dearly departed Michael Crichton, but I think it's somebody who still writes and publishes today. And that quote goes something along the lines of, when somebody options my book, I simply hold out my hand and a check mysteriously (laughs) appears in it. And then all is good in the world. Heinlein was the same way. He was like, yes, I, I actually do this for a living. I'm not an artist. I'm glad people like my books. But I, I am here to pay my mortgage. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like this is this is what I do. And if you're gonna pay me, that's fine. If you're gonna fuck it up, that's all on you. Thanks for paying me. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I'm I'm gonna keep writing regardless. <laughs> well, there was uh there was this uh notation once about Stephen King, him going into his publishing house and saying, I have an idea. And they basically open the checkbook and write a ten million dollar check and just hand it to him because they know they're gonna make that back. So I do want to talk, going back into the game stuff yes. for a moment, yes. one of the reasons that I do love the Pirates of the Spanish Main setting for Savage Worlds is that Can it also that? incorporates fighting schools. Your character can subscribe to a fighting school. So if you are familiar with D20, you can take a feat. You know, a feat is like, here's the thing that you get to do. It's a cool thing. You might get a plus two to attack at this point or... A plus two to defense if your opponent is flying or you're going to get a strange bonus. In Savage Worlds, they have what are called edges. Edges, you know, we we played that demo game of the lost episode. Yeah. (laughs) And an edge is essentially like, a. it's basically a feat. It's a cool thing that you get to do that other characters don't get to. In the Pirates of the Spanish Main setting... The fighting schools are special edges that give you a minor bonus now, but once your character reaches what is called a legendary level, which in D20 is basically the equivalent of like level 12 or so, the edge evolves into a new power. You don't have to buy it again. You don't have to buy the next level power, but because you've had this edge for so long, You've reached a point where you have become so good at it that the edge itself, the ability, has evolved into a new ability for free. I love that if you are playing a swashbuckling campaign. This is not a swashbuckling campaign, but it could be. <laughs> you know, I, I opened uh, this this book. You, uh, you just handed me the Pirates of the Spanish Main. And I read the little Avast there Avast, at the uh, beginning. Yeah. And instantly, I think I lost a permanent inch off my penis. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is just, but this is that pirate shit I'm talking about. <laughs> this just read it. The, Go ahead. Read it. Read no, it I don't. No, no, no. no, no, it's, no it's don't, bad. don't read it. The game itself looks good, but God, I am so sick of fucking pirates. I mean, they, they, they're, the, they're the villains. They're the bad guys. Pirates. Um, they're dirty. They're filthy. They run shitty ships. And they should not be idolized, damn it. This game does a lot. Oh, sorry. Pirates have gone over saturation like vampires have. I'm so tired of pirates, and I'm so tired of vampires. And zombies. And zombies. Pirates versus vampires versus zombies. You know what? I would watch that movie once and then get it out of my system (laughs) and then move on. And this is coming from someone who wrote a goddamn zombie role-playing game, (laughs) which uses playing cards but i don't want to talk about that, that was a nice now. bring around no <laughs> always 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 shamelessly plug man do yes, it just do it you should so what do you uh, think scott do you think this would work do i think this would work i want i want, yeah. I want to know more about okay. 
I which think, would you choose? Okay, which would I choose? I would always love to play Duty and Honor and Beat to Quarters. If we were redoing Sea and Shores, or we were picking up the little tag that has been offered, Matthew. Oh, right. Uh, that Matthew offered, then Pirates of the Spanish Main, because that's that style. That's the style. It, you know, it's close combat. Yeah. There, you can't do that in Beat to Quarters. Beat to Quarters is more, more big story. You know, it's more about out. the movie yeah, and yeah. less about the fight. Yeah, so I was going to say the same thing. The, the 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 beat to quarters, I think, would be the the minutia yeah. of the movie, and I think the pirates would be the fantastical. Let's go out and blow shit up and steal yeah. all their stuff. Um, and and Matthew's story, your follow up, your whole scene of commanding the ship and and, and trying to keep them back. Savage Worlds can do that. The the rules. Against, I like Savage Worlds. I'd play the shit out of it. Yeah, the way that they handle nameless enemies you can just like destroy seas of them that are hoarding upon you it's so easy to play yeah however for the minutiae for running a nautical game i'm with you scott i think beat to quarters was where it's at and don't get me wrong just because i wrote that thing i i am fascinated by beat to quarters and i would love to play that myself yeah i I would don't worry i'll write a whole new thing for that one i think i'd I'd love it yeah and i'd like to give a special shout out to neil gow who put these games back on the market after I contacted him and said, oh, wow. I want to do a podcast and we're going to talk about this. Oh, this that's was awesome. months ago when I thought that Master and Commander was going to be like episode 10. Ah. <laughs> I'm just so, glad we finally got to it. It kept getting pushed back and I'm like, this is my favorite movie, but please! I could, not, I could not find a physical copy of the game and yeah. I said, look, dude, I want a physical copy of your games. And he put them back on the market. Now, That's Scott, awesome. did you say that you this is 1.0 or something like that? Yes, he is currently writing the second edition. Ooh. Uh, so, well, it's the second edition of Duty and Honor. So, Duty and Honor is uh-huh. the is the is the Peninsular War, which is you know Napoleonic War, depending upon whatever. And then Beat to Quarters is the is the naval part of that. So, Duty and Honor is if you have seen mm-hmm. the Duelists, or Duty of Honor is basically that game, or Sharp, or, or Rich, R- not Richard like Sharp that movie. That's fine. Sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah. So Richard Sharp, Sharp's Rifles. Um, yeah. So the, the the novels by Bernard Bernard Cornwall, or the you know the movies with or TV movies with Sean Bean, amazing uh, Peninsula War stuff. Uh, so Duty and Honor is getting a second edition with updated rules, in which he has already stated he is going to have two. Uh, Duty and Honor has a generalized setting. Uh huh. He's going to have two generalized settings. One he's going to call historical and one he's going to call, I think he's just calling it fantasy, but I don't think it, I, I'm not sure what it's called, but the historical one follows, you know, history. And the second one says, you know, where we've evolved as people, not all characters have to be male and not all characters have to be straight. And, you know, so, mm-hmm. so, like you know, alternate history. Yeah. Play as you play as you want. Here's how to play that. Okay. And so he's definitely freeing up the genre. Yeah, freeing up the nice. genre. He's doing it great. And and I love that. And these are topics that. that we brought up last time you were on the so, show with the three Musketeers yeah. and the games that we talked about yeah. that were very much like all characters must be that's male. That's just the yeah. problem of historical yeah. Yeah. fiction. Yeah. Um, that's all I got. I, I love the series. If you haven't watched the movie, ha- watch, watch the movie. The movie. If it you haven't good. read the books, read the books. If you haven't played Beat to Quarters like I haven't, play Beat to Quarters. During the break, I downloaded the first book on my Kindle. Yeah, I, boy. I bought it off a of Kindle. But yeah, this is all of this is good. You you need this in your life. That's all I got. It's fantastic. All right. All right. Well, let's take it out. We had our, our special guest tonight. Uh, Scott Hazel. I'm here talking about literary fiction and uh, in, in, in its <laughs> effect on movies and role-playing games. Yeah, we we're glad to have you. I was uh, Matthew. And I'm Dusty. I'm Nathaniel. And we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Yep. And... Uh, Coming up next, we have Dune. <gasps> Two? It's yeah. a twofer? Yeah, we've got Oh, yeah, God, got my nipples Dune. are hard. <laughs> the, the 1984 David Lynch uh, version I'm of ready Dune. for this. <laughs> I wanted to throw that in there. I wanted to it see is get by your the guys juice of Safu, the thoughts acquire speed, the lifts the acquire stain, stain, the stain becomes a warning, warning is by will alone. I set, set my mind, mind in motion. motion. Yeah, we're going to have fun with this. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll see you. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to another episode of our show. We're a new name in the enormous sea of podcasts and appreciate any feedback that you can send our way. If you like what you've heard, or even if you didn't, please leave us a review and let us know. 
Got a movie or a game that you want to hear us talk about? Drop us a comment on our website at havemovieswillgame.com or hit us up on any of the usual social networks. We'd love to hear from you. The opening theme music is Rock and Gravel by Sid Valentine's Patent Leather Kids, part of the public domain and found on publicdomain4u.com. Opening narration is provided by Isaac Scher. Half Movies Will Game is distributed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you again next week.